Okay. Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa. Annyeonghaseyo and hello all. Welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 92nd seminar, and I call it on MIT Day. I have been in California, another side of MIT, uh, to give five talks and visit and meet many people at UC Berkeley, NASA, Stanford University, JBA, and ACS annual meeting. It has been so great to meet many people and have a short family vacation here. And probably it might be my last summer trip this year. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Ron Weiss. I'm not sure how can, how can I introduce him briefly. Obviously, we, he does not need any introduction because we all know him. He is a professor at MIT and co-director of MIT Synthetic Body Center, where I finished my postdoctoral training due to Chris Boyk's move to MIT from UCSF. Ron is, Ron is the pioneer of synthetic biology who established the field by publishing amazing papers on bacterial genetic circuits 20 years ago in the old paper he published, I actually read, and then I become a synthetic biologist. Amazingly, he switched his focus from bacterial synthetic biology to mammalian synthetic biology. This is a very brave thing. I mean, I never thought about in my career I wanted to do so until recently. When he moved to MIT from Princeton University, I mean, uh, he basically changed the, the topic from the uh, bacteria to mammalian, I believe. And personally, it was my great honor when he asked for my four input ND gate data and figure to use them for his lecture at MIT. That's uh, more than 10 years ago. So Ron, it is great to see you again virtually. And thank you so much for your pioneering work in synthetic biology and education and virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you again. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, tremendous series. I just really wanna congratulate you on what you've been able to do. It's quite phenomenal. And now that you are a YouTube star with so many, uh, you know, hits and watches and, and just amazing collection of, you know, YouTube lectures and 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 talks and, and also the notion of, of being able to provide an opportunity for young scientists to really uh, get an exposure. So, so I think it's fantastic on, on really multiple fronts. So, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, so I'll just say a few words really, uh, and then, you know, Jennifer is the star of the show. And so I, I don't want to take too much from that. Um, let's see. So I will share my uh, screen now. Okay. And then you're, you're able to see this correctly. Um, so can you, uh, yeah, can, you just, flip, can you flip oh, in okay. the way you see, you see the, your slide, not the note. Okay. So this is showing one second. I uh, guess swap, swap. Place. Uh, Is this? Uh, I mean, it's still smaller. Okay. Uh, let me actually stop the share. Yeah. And I will share one second. Mm -hmm. okay, obviously, by the way, I'm a computer scientist, so I should be able to figure these things <laughs> out. <laughs> but, but maybe that this is why I actually switched to uh, synthetic biology. Um, <laughs> and let's see, I will now share my entire desktop and see if this works. Yes, could you okay. make it bigger? Yep, and so I'm gonna swap oh. displays. No, uh, swap displays. Okay, so how oh, about this? Oh, no, no, not working. Okay, fantastic. Only a few minutes. So we'll take it out of my time. Uh, 
So yeah, you know, again, a real pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to to interact with everyone here. Um, so I'll, you know, just give a few few words. Um, you know, in terms of Tezak wanted to ask about you know vision or, or some words of advice, and for me, perhaps the way I want to start and, and one of the most important things to think about in terms of engaging in synthetic biology research is really identifying what you're passionate about. And I think this is the thing that, that really should lead many of things, many of the choices that you make about how to spend your time and what research to pursue. And this is not something that needs to be singular. You can be passionate about multiple things and you can also change uh, what you're passionate about. Um, so that, you know, evolve as well. But it, it is really important to, to figure this out and just, you know, be able to be super excited about what you're doing and, you know, not be able to fall asleep at night just thinking about, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, let me figure this thing out. And so I've, I've, I've found that to be really a great way to, you know, lead the research and think about the projects that I want to do. You know, so you could potentially in synthetic biology have a passion about wanting to cure a particular disease, you know, it could be for personal reasons. You could want to solve real world problems or address unmet needs, or perhaps, you want to use synthetic biology to really understand how uh, the world works in, in interesting ways. Or for many of us, it's also just the sheer notion of wanting to create cool new stuff, uh, you know, new technologies. Uh, hopefully they're useful, but just the mere act of making, you know, cool gadgets it by itself uh, a lot of fun. And so there are many other ways by which uh, or things that you can be passionate about but I do encourage you to to think about that deeply and, and have that guide the kinds of things that you do and, and how you spend your time doing synthetic biology research. So for me, um, what I'm passionate about is actually programming. And my synthetic biology journey actually started when I was eight years old and I was uh, programming mainframes uh, using punch cards. So this was just, you know, I just got you know exposed to programming. I was like, oh my God, this is just so cool. And over the years, uh, you know, the the programming environment that I was using, the co you know, computing that I was using uh has has certainly evolved. Uh, but it is the most um kind of dramatic thing that happened is that uh as a graduate student with Tom Knight 25 years ago, I really became fascinated with programming cells. And once I realized that this is possible, I've said to myself, this is what I have to do for the rest of my life. It just, it's just too, too exciting. You know, in terms of thinking about uh, programming cells, in terms of this notion of being able to design biological programs that uh, specify desired behaviors, uh, for example, some sense and respond elements, and then understanding how to convert these into gene regulatory networks, encoding these on uh, genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA, and having that uh, be embedded into the cells, you know, thinking about cells as being programmable and understanding how we want to be able to extend or modify the behavior of cells. And so the, the way I often structure my research is by thinking about genetic programs, synthetic biology genetic programs, that would result in a paradigm shift in particular areas. So one of them I believe is cancer immunotherapy, where this notion of being able to specify multi-input logic circuits that can be embedded on uh, therapeutic agents that uh, go inside cells and then make very precise decisions about whether the cell is a cancer cell or not, I really think is a is a new way you know, and, and certainly has uh, gained a lot of grounds over the last few years in terms of how we treat cancer. Uh, there's And there's other uh, very exciting opportunities in cell-based therapies where the notion of engineering cells to sense particular conditions in the body, abnormal uh, blood biomarker levels, uh, uh, immune misregulation. I think there are tremendous opportunities there. And something else that we also uh, focus on a lot in the lab is the notion of being able to program stem cells uh, with multi-step developmental programs to create programmable organoids. And, and again, the notion of a genetic program that's embedded in cells really changes uh, what is possible. 
And so this notion of programming, you know, when I got started as a graduate student, I said, yeah, let me, uh, you know, take what I know in computers and apply that to biology. And I just need to, you know, learn a little bit about biology. And so my notion of biological systems was encapsulated in this kind of image that you're seeing here from one of my colleagues, Tim Liu, of this really modular, uh, you know, programmable environment. But over the years, I've realized that there's other, you know, ways to think about cells that are uh, a little bit messier. And so I, I wouldn't say that I've completely shifted towards that other side, but I do appreciate, you know, the messiness that uh, is included in biology, and, you know, and that really brings up a whole array of challenges that we have to deal with uh, that we don't necessarily have to deal with in other contexts. But there's an exci exciting opportunities to really combine systems and synthetic biology and probably to mix it with some AI in terms of achieving robust engineering of cells. Uh, so that is tremendously exciting. And, and in terms of thinking about how you want to structure your research, you know, what I often like to do is, is think about the grand challenges and uh, and those you know drive the research that I do, uh, thinking about shooting for the moon, but also understanding how you can take realistic intermediate steps to get there. So you can have you know publishable units and, and demonstrable uh, progress. And so uh, lastly, I really want to mention the journey. So it's not just about the end goal. And I've had uh, just I've been tremendously fortunate to have uh, an amazing journey with an ever growing community of research that I've had close interactions uh, with in my lab. And that, that really is the gist of it. Really, I you know tremendously enjoy the, you know, the interactions that I get um, uh, with researchers in the lab and really talking about um, the research and understanding how to solve problems and figure out strategic uh, directions. So that that's really where, what I want to highlight is uh, enjoy the journey, enjoy the interactions that you have uh, with folks that that you're able to. And so uh, I want to thank you. Uh, and I really look forward to uh, to Jennifer's uh, talk. That That is amazing. You know, Ron, you're always giving me think something, and this time, you know, I your talk remind me of your great contribution and impact. And one thing I wanted to uh, mention, you know, we had used to have the you know synthetic biology working group lunch, I believe, at MIT, you know, more than ten years ago. At the time we met, uh, weekly, and then one day you show up, you are talking about pattern formation, Turing pattern formation. At that time I was, oh my God, that he gonna do it. And then in, after many, many years later, you publish about that one, I think PNAS with the uh, David Cargi, I yeah. think. And he yeah. actually going to be a speaker next week. And yeah. then yeah. another paper I remember, you know, you kind of showing today, that is a second wave of synthetic biology. That's my fav one of my favorite paper because you kind of lay out the future. And then many of them you mentioned actually happening right now. So now mm -hmm. I you also influenced me because I never thought about doing something beyond the bacteria, but I'm actually working on organoids, you know, for two years, but nothing yeah. work. Okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's how I know you are very brave and pioneer because you switch from bacteria to mammalian cell. So mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. I, I I love what you're talking about. I mean, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. So send my regards to David, by the way. Yeah, uh, I'll do and, so. Yeah. And ask him to maybe tell you the seven about the 17 years that it took to get from initial concept to publication of the Turing pattern paper. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I heard super... about that because you mentioned very early uh, during my career in as a graduate student. And I, when I saw that paper, finally, I yeah. so much love that paper. Yeah, it was. It, okay, it thank was you so much. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay, so now, the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Jennifer Nash, recently finished up, uh, her PhD in chemical engineering at MIT, and now a lecturer for the department, the same department, chemical engineering, teaching undergraduate student 
in both lecture and lab courses. I just heard she will teach uh, the biology course for the engineers. Outside of the lab, Jennifer is an avid hiker, reader, and loves to bake. And prior to attending MIT, she got her bachelor degree in chemical engineering at Auburn University and played trumpet in the marching band. And during her graduate study, her research focused on the application of biosensor to directed evolution screens with the specific application being the improvement of the production of glucaric acid in E. coli. I especially thank her for continuing to perform glucaric acid project that I studied with Kristara Prather, our common PhD advisor. To be honest, the follow projects on glucaric acid became harder and harder due to uh, one inefficient enzyme from animal that is actually called myox. Throughout her work, many interesting challenges and roadblocks have come up that prevented the successful application of the biosensor to screen for improved enzyme mutants. I believe in her talk, she will discuss the work that went into improving the robustness of this biosensor toward its application for finding improved myox variants and some of the broader principles she discovered along the way. Jennifer, congrats again on becoming a lecturer at MIT as I predicted when I met for the first time in 2021 at the Chris Prather lab. To be fair, I did not predict you know, she would become a lecturer at MIT, but I predicted she would be a great teacher or lecturer after I heard her explaining things during my visit at the time to my daughter, teenage daughter, and then my daughter understand every single complex concept she explained. Jennifer, thanks for your passion of teaching and mentoring younger students. And please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you so much for organizing this. I am really excited to get to talk to y'all about the work that I did during my PhD in Chris Prather's lab. So... All right, and is everyone see, are we seeing screen and not presenter view? Yes. All right, great. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jennifer Nash. I am a lecturer in the Department of Chemical Engineering, as y'all just heard. And today I will be talking about the work that I did. And I put the word towards there. Um, it's funny, I was talking to a friend who works in who worked in computer science and chemical engineering. And he said, yeah, everyone in our field just puts towards when it's something that you didn't quite finish. And I said, well, this sounds perfect for where I was at, that I learned a lot but the whole project is still moving towards the application of biosensors in the directed evolution of myonositol oxygenase. To give a little bit of a roadmap of where I'll be going in my talk today, first I'll give you guys background and problem introduction. I'll discuss how I characterize the tools I used in my work. Then when the characterization uh, showed us some interesting things. I'll talk about then some solutions we made to increase the robustness of the system. And finally, what we could conclude from the work I did, as well as the future directions that hopefully someone will be taking this project in the lab. First for the background. Now, as someone who has a degree in chemical engineering, but worked in more biological spaces, I got a lot of questions when I would describe my research of weight, you told me you were a chemical engineer. So I generally like to introduce my slides by talking about how I believe this area of work can bridge the gap between the two fields and how I talk about microbial production as chemical systems. So when I teach the freshmen and sophomores their intro to chemical engineering class, we talk a lot about how in chemical engineering, what we wanna do is manipulate chemical processes to transform some input 
that is less desirable into an output that is more desirable. And we can think that this typically as chemical process engineers would happen in chemical factories. And if I were teaching my material and energy balance class, we would draw a box and we'd put some arrows and we would think about what is happening inside the box and what can I change inside the box? And as it turns out, when we think about synthetic biology or microbial engineering, instead of factories, we have cells and we're thinking of small microbial cellular factories that are taking hopefully renewable input raw materials that can move us towards a more renewable synthesis of chemicals and giving us our desired output. Now, the issue is cellular factories have limitations that make them not as able to make money as some of the processes that already exist, which is why we haven't seen a great replacement of all of our petrochemical factories with these sustainable microbial factories, because we as engineers have to come up with the solutions to improve going from input raw material to desired output. And so we can think of issues such as the cell wants to focus on its own growth and its own DNA over the synthetic pathway that we have put inside. We can think of the fact that the growth suffers because a synthetic pathway will siphon off all the resources. And no matter how much our pathway is expressed, if our cells aren't growing, we get low levels of products. Or sometimes the products we want to make are toxic to the cells. And though these are not all of the issues that can arise, these are some of the things we think about as engineers of how can we turn these microbial systems into more productive little microbial factories. To zoom in on the specific project and synthetic pathway that I worked on, we were turning glucose into glucaric acid. And this was a pathway that was made in the Prather lab. Um, and it went through a process of three heterologous enzymes from other organisms and was done in E. coli. So first, the glucose would go through the phosphotransferase system and get phosphorylated. And the first of the heterologous enzymes, MIPS, as well as another endogenous phosphatase would get our first main pathway intermediate, myonositol. Myonositol is transformed by myonositol oxygenase. This particular variant came, that we use commonly came from a mouse. And this would get our penultimate intermediate, glucuronic acid. And from glucuronic acid, we had a urinate dehydrogenase, and this would give us our final desired product, glucaric acid. Glucaric acid has not many applications on its own, but many applications as a building block for polymers, as a building block for things like anti-fouling agents, things like um, the enzymes that are gonna go in your laundry detergent. And so it is a great value added product that you can really functionalize it, polymerize it, put it into other useful items. But I am standing here today talking to you about my work because we needed to improve the production and we we're just seeing consistently low titers. And as was mentioned, many people before me had worked on improving the productivity of this pathway. And some had even worked in a form of directed evolution and screens. And that is because we have enzyme issues in the pathway. Here is a plot from a previous paper that has been modified and showing the specific activity levels of the three key enzymes in the pathway. And we can see that UDH, which catalyzes the last step, looks pretty good. MIPS isn't great, but it's still okay. And we see that MIOX has the lowest relative activity of all of our heterologous enzymes, which made it a great target for directed evolution and modification so that we could take a low performing enzyme and if we could increase it, we could remove a bottleneck in the pathway to allow for higher levels of glucuronic acid, which due to the high level of UDH expression, should then allow for higher levels of glucaric acid. But how would we want to modify this enzyme? And there are a lot of ways that we are able to do this. Some are going to be targeted ways where you take a known amino acid that you want to change in the DNA. You change the DNA that encodes for that amino acid. And then from there, 
you'll get some sort of change in how the protein folds and how the protein functions. And theoretically, you'll get a new acting enzyme. The challenge is when we think about building and building libraries, various variants of the enzyme, we're going to have a lot of variants that perform exactly the same we're gonna have a lot of variants that do not work at all because this protein sequence has evolved for a reason. And hopefully we're gonna have at least one or two that perform better. But what we're going to want to do when we look at lots and lots of sequences is be able to quickly know and understand if the modified enzyme is indeed superior to the original enzyme. But traditional methods of chemical quantification are very slow and time consuming. You could have tons and tons and tons of HPLCs running to try and get tons and tons and tons of chemical quantification happening in parallel, but not all academic labs have access to all of this material. And so this can be a huge time sink into the project that if you're testing millions of library variants and waiting for an HPLC, both your lab mates are gonna hate you for taking all the equipment time and you're just not gonna be able to get the throughput you need. However, if we can connect the level of our desired chemical to an output that we can measure, then we can increase the throughput of our quantification specifically by using, ideally in this project, we are looking to use fax cell sorting to connect a green fluorescent output to the level of our product. And so now we have our library and instead of needing to know the quantity of the chemical, we have a proxy for the level of our desired output and we can choose the one that is the most fluorescent. And to bridge the gap between what is produced and the fluorescent signal that we want, we can utilize transcriptional regulation in bacterial cells through biosensors. So just a general for those who may not have worked specifically in biosensors or transcriptional regulation, the idea is that we're going to, and Here's the central dogma. I give this talk quite often to people that don't like biology that much. So I try to throw that as a reminder. So we have our transcription factor that goes along, it gets transcribed, it gets translated. And then once the protein is made, this protein will then recognize operator sites. And when it recognizes the operator sites, though there are many modes of how this regulation occurs, I'm gonna be specifically focusing on when this transcription factor protein will prevent access of RNA polymerase to our gene of interest. With no transcription, we get no translation and we get no protein. However, the cool thing about transcription factors is they natively respond to certain metabolites. And so this way, we have a way to know when our small molecule or ligand is present. So when the ligand is present, it will change the conformation of our transcription factor protein. It will relieve that DNA binding and allow for our expression of the gene of interest. And once that is transcribed and translated, we will get the protein expression that we are looking for. Specifically, when I was looking at transcription factors that would work for my project, I needed one who metabolite that it responded to was something that was natively in our pathway. So that way we didn't have to do any transformations of our metabolites to add more and more layers of steps between the desired product and what we got. And our gene of interest was a fluorescent protein. The transcription factor was found by another lab mate of mine who worked in detection of a different chemical, but galacturonic acid, which my lab mate worked in, and glucuronic acid both natively respond to a transcription factor called EXUR that was from B. subtilis. And as I mentioned, our reporter gene was a green fluorescent protein, so that way we could use cell sorting. And to make sure it worked, what we wanted to do is just see uh, whether the behavior that we expected was true. So we're expecting to see without any product, it is inactive and there is no fluorescence, so we have a fully off state. But then with sufficient level of glucuronic acid, which is directly after our problem enzyme myox, we are going to see the transcription factor leave and get fluorescent signal, which moves me into the idea of tool characterization. How do we know whether the tool worked and what it was doing? Ideally, if the biosensor is effective, it will show 
minimal signal when there is no product and a good amount of signal when there is product. So first to test this with only the biosensor, we added ourselves the glucuronic acid into the cells before having any sort of synthesis within the cell of this chemical. So in this plot, I'll be showing you fluorescence as a function of added glucuronate or glucuronic acid. And what we saw was the dose response curve that we expected, which was good that this biosensor had been proven to work with other small molecules, but we wanted to make sure it would work with glucuronate. And though it was a very narrow region of glucuronate that we added to the cell, we could see that we still got a nearly linear response over a range. And based on the low levels of production that we had been seeing in cells, we expected that as long as we did not overexpress the pathway, that these were realistic levels of glucuronic acid that we could expect to be produced from the cells. So this initial characterization said that the biosensor was effective and was able to do what we were hoping, which made the next step to be what happens with in vivo production. In this system, we had a production plasmid as well as a biosensor plasmid. And that little squiggle is just showing you that the cell has its own DNA that is taking up some of the necessary RNA polymerases and some of the ribosomes. But I'll get into why I've included that little detail later in the talk. And so there was the pathway. We only included the myox enzyme. We were starting from myonositol and not all the way from glucose. And there was the biosensor circuit. So these are the two main genetic circuits we are concerned with. We have expression of a myox enzyme controlled through addition of ATC through TETR regulation. And then we have our biosensor circuit. And what we were able to see, once again, showing GFP on the y-axis and our titer of our desired metabolite on the x-axis, we see that with increasing levels of produced glucuronate from our pathway, we also get increasing levels of GFP. So not only does the system work when we add the target inducer ourselves, but the system also works when we produce this product in vivo which indicates that this has high potential for high throughput screening of mutant enzymes. And what we also wanted to do is see if we could do the full pathway, because ideally when we're doing this screening, we want our system to be as similar to production as we could. And so here we added one more step. We went backwards to glucose and we had both the MIPS and the myox enzyme, as well as once again, that same biosensor circuit. And what we saw here was not quite what we expected. Whereas before we saw the anticipated increasing fluorescence for increasing titers, here we saw the reverse, where as the titer increased, the GFP decreased, but what we believe was actually the correlation here is that the increasing levels of glucose that we supplemented to get to these increasing titers was actually impacting the biosensor more than the increasing levels of glucuronate that we made in the cellular circuit. And so this was the first of the sort of cross regulations that we realized that when we put these synthetic systems, these circuits into a living cell, what we actually saw was that other sorts of interactions that were going on that we were not fully aware of, nor did we have the ways or means to find out that would allow me to finish my PhD in a reasonable amount of time, that these were actually keeping some of the work we wanted to do from being able to be completed. And so moving forward, we said, we will address the glucose problem once we have applied this to a screen from our intermediate myonositol. And so we move forward using only the myox enzyme and starting from our intermediate myonositol. And so moving on from there, we wanted to start applying the biosensor and to start really digging into using it for that single cell sorting, which was the goal of the project. So this was the response I showed you before that we had a nice linear response curve to different levels of titer from different levels of substrate. This was done in triplicate in tubes. So we're thinking bulk culture that these fluorescence readings are the averages 
of millions and millions and millions of cells all generating fluorescence. But the goal is single cell detection. And at the single cell, things are a lot more heterogeneous than these very nice, pretty tight readings would have us believe. So what we wanted to do first is see if we could replicate this response looking at the whole range of what the fluorescence was with the histograms that we would get from taking these to cell sorting. So grew them up in the culture tubes just as before, but now we detected the fluorescence at the single cell level. So the x-axis here is showing increasing GFP and the colors will say how much substrate we had and the amount of substrate we fed directly correlates to how much of our titer we get. So with more MI or myonositol, we expect more glucuronic acid. And the good news was at the single cell level, we still see this increase in fluorescent output with increasing substrate level, which indicated that the single cell level is still showing these trends we saw in the bulk culture, which was in our mind, step number one to ensuring that our applications to directed evolution would be successful. And what we could see is that, again, similar to bulk culture, we have replication of this at the single cell level. But the next thing it needs to be effective is that it has to be able to separate out populations. So before I took one tube where everything had experienced the same conditions, everything had the same sets of plasmids, and we took that to cell sorting. But what we really wanted to do is see what is gonna happen if I mix in the same tube, two populations of cells, and then take that set of cells after they've grown up to cell sorting. And so here what we did is we replaced in half of our cells, the active myonositol oxygenase with an inactive version of it with the idea that our active version is generating product, and so it should be fluorescing, whereas the inactive version is going to remain non-fluorescent. So we generally mix these 50 to 50 at inoculation. We did PCR tests to ensure that this was the ratio that was still present at the time of our screen, and we took this culture and we sent it to cell sorting. Now, what we would expect is all of the results have lined up so far. So we would expect to see on that fluorescence histogram, a population of non-producing cells with lower GFP, as well as a population of higher producing cells with a normal amount of GFP. And we would expect this separation because that is what the cell sorter is doing. It's looking at these individual cells. So we had one control, which was a culture fully of non-producing cells and another control that was fully producing cells. And we would expect to see with less event counts split halfway what our mixed culture was. And what we saw was not that. So with these initial tests, we actually saw that there was a high activation of these non-producing cells such that after about 12 hours of culture, we had almost the same level of activation for a mixed producing and non-producing set of cells as we did or a fully producing cells, which indicated that there was false activation of these non-producing cells. And we believe that it is because product was being made by the cells with the production pathway that was active. And then it was actually diffusing and being imported into our cells that were not producing. So we were getting false activation of cells that were not doing any production themselves. We were able to find that there is an active importer for glucuronic acid present in the genome of E. coli, and this is the gene EXUT. So what EXUT would do is once the product was made, it naturally diffuses out of the cell with no need of any sort of membrane-bound transport, and then EXUT will allow for the import of glucuronic acid. And so this way, it will go from a producing cell to a non-producing cell and actually attain almost the same level of activation without having to make any product itself at all. And so by removing this gene from the genome, we saw no sort of negative consequences. And really the main thing that we saw was that while the product could still diffuse out of the cell so we could quantify it in the extracellular media, it no longer could get in and falsely activate the cells. So here's that same negative control, positive control from before with our EXUT knockout cells. 
And here we saw that split activation showing that our deactivated cells with no product production remained deactivated, whereas our producing cells were able to have that level of activation. So we were really excited to see that through transporter knockout, we were able to really improve the behavior of our biosensor and wanted to start moving closer and closer to our single cell work. And so we removed this gene and we prevented false activation. We wanted to first, before we did a bunch of work and a bunch of evolution, test out what would happen if we made some sort of a fake library that contains just different versions of the myox gene that have different known productivity levels. To do this, what we chose to test was the variant we'd been using, the mouse myox. We chose a variant from rat because the sequence similarity was very high. So we expected these to be close in production, but not quite the same. We chose a flavobacterium myox because previous work in our lab had indicated that this worked and was successful in E. coli, as well as Aridopsis thaliana, which is commonly used in production of glucaric acid in yeast. So we really wanted to compare these four variants of the enzyme, three of which had been well characterized in the Prather lab. And now I've kind of delayed showing you the results because once again, these were results that we didn't fully expect to see. So this is our dose response to three different levels of myonositol, three different glucuronic acid titers, and then we see a linear trend in fluorescent output. If we go to the rat myox, which had high sequence similarity, we see the behavior is pretty similar. We see the slopes of the response are, again, very similar. And we see different output levels for different fluorescents. So this was promising when we looked at these two variants. And yet when we stepped into FJ myox, we saw both significantly higher production as well as a very, very different GFP as related to product trend. And then once we went to the AT myox variant, we actually saw, though it's still an increase in product relative to the mouse myox, a severe decrease in fluorescence. And while the FJ myox is also showing very variant behavior, what we are seeing is a failure of the biosensor because across these four different species, which we could imagine that an evolved variant of the myox enzyme is similar to a myox enzyme from a different species in terms of the fact that when the protein sequence is different, these differences could lead to an inability of the biosensor to actually detect improved production because if AT myox had higher production and low fluorescence, we did not have confidence that our enzymatic library members could actually show us higher fluorescence or higher production. And so we do not see a reliability. And we think that there is some sort of an issue in what is going on in how the myox enzyme is taking and holding resources. And that is because we saw a significant lower growth in our lowest fluorescing uh, biosensor myox pair. And we saw that this delayed growth, even if we normalize the GFP, did not account for what was making this difference. So we believe that biosensor and production plasmids are implicitly impacting each other due to a high demand on cellular resources, which can lead to growth defects and can also lead to very different biosensor behavior. And to illustrate this a little bit, I'll just talk about how a cell has a limited pool of resources, the main resources that we need to express our proteins being our RNA polymerase and our ribosome. So once again, thinking about the fact that we need both of these to go from DNA to protein, we can think that the cell's own genetic information needs some of these resources to function. We can think that our pathway takes some, as well as our biosensor. And if we think of this as the fact that all of these are being simultaneously used by the cell, and there's only so many, we can say, oh, well, we lose some from there. We lose some from our antibiotic resistance genes, we lose some from our transcription, transcriptional regulation genes, and we are also going to lose some from myonositol. And thinking about the timing 
of when our fluorescent output is expressed based on sort of this idea of a cascade that we need sufficient glucuronic acid, which means all the other proteins have been expressed. By the time we get to this fluorescent protein, the cell is struggling to have any sort of resources left to give. And so in certain cases, when the myox enzyme itself is highly demanding, is when we believe we were going to see these lower levels of GFP output. So we thought, how can we decrease this burden? How can we make it so that these different systems have more similar behavior? So we looked at the fact that we had a pretty strong promoter on the GFP gene because we really wanted to increase the difference between our fully expressed GFP signal and our non-expressed GFP signal. So we addressed that. We decreased the promoter strength such that we still had a clear difference in expression between our different levels of glucuronic acid, but hopefully to decrease some of that burden. And so I will always be showing on that left side of my screen what our original system looked like and what the modifications did for the resulting sort of dose response curves. And what we saw was that our AT myox, that red line that was our worst line, did start to improve and show more similar output levels to at least the FJ myox, if not the mouse myox and the rat myox. And we saw a slight improvement in growth as well, but we did still see a delay in the growth and in the rate at which the growth sort of leveled off. So decreasing it gave us some gains, but not quite enough. So then we wanted to bring down the burden by changing how we expressed our system. Before it had been a biosensor plasmid and a production plasmid. And so we instead combined all of our gene expression onto one single plasmid. And we saw even better returns here by switching to a single plasmid system such that the AT myox was almost showing the same level of expression as our mouse myox and our rat myox. And we can see that throughout all of these different changes, we see a pretty big drop in our absolute fluorescent signal, but we still see good differences relatively between our activation levels. But the growth was still delayed. We still saw this difference in growth that indicated that we hadn't fully addressed what was going on. So we worked and we thought, it's one plasmid, promoter strength is lower, what else can we do? And so with this idea, we wanted to change how we expressed the protein. And instead of immediately inducing our producer protein, we thought, why don't we wait a little bit? And then at four hours into the experiment, wait to induce the expression of our myox protein and begin our generation of product. And what we saw here was very similar behavior of the fluorescence to the titers as our last solution, but we saw a complete restoration of growth, which indicated that giving the cells time to grow and begin that process before inducing our heterologous pathway was a way to bring back the growth, get consistent growth across our variants, as well as consistent outputs, which do still show some differences, but show more consistency than we had seen in any other setup. And so, with this delay and with the single plasmid system and with the lower promoter strength, we really were able to see a lot of the severe burden disappear and improve performance, which was really exciting for us. So we said, let's see if we can apply the sensor. The two variants we chose to make another sort of mock library was the mouse variant and the rat variant because they had showed very similar dose response curves but still showed differences in fluorescence and titer at the same levels of myo-inositol substrate. And we thought that this difference, if we could detect it with our biosensor at the single cell level, we had an indication that this system could eventually be modified to work for the desired goal of an enzyme library. So I took them, we mixed the culture 50-50 in a tube, so 50% of the mouse myox, 50% of the rat myox, verified it once again by PCR right before we took it to cell sorting. And what we saw is there was blue is our mouse only control, yellow is our rat only control, and the green is our mixture of the two. And we see that 
we have a little peak that overlaps the rat and a little peak that overlaps the mouse, which from this indicated to us that our population was expressing that mixture. And so what we could do is take the higher end, so generally screening such that we got a minimal amount of the rat myox variants based on our control histograms. And we would take that small bit of the culture and we would grow it overnight and we would plate it. After we plated it, we'd choose a random set of about 50 colonies and then I would grow these colonies up again. And we would look at the trend of fluorescence as compared to production once more. And we had our yellow rat myox control here on this plot and our blue mouse myox control. And what was really exciting is we did see these two distinct clusters. And that's showing that we are getting a desired split of population. We were able to enrich from what began at about 50-50 to now what is maybe one cheater rat myox getting through. And when we chose 10 random variants for sequencing, all 10 of them in this instance were rat myox. So we were really able to enrich the population. So we said, well, we started at 50% and we got close to 100%. What if we increase the stringency and we start with 1% of mouse myox and 99% of rat myox? And are we gonna be able to do this? So you can see now that this green mixture peak overlaps a lot more with our rat myox peak, indicating that we did indeed have a lot more showing that level of production. So once again, we chose a sliver of this histogram as our sorting gate and said only select the cells that express at least this much GFP. Once again, we put them on the plate, we grew them up and we were able to see two distinct sort of subpopulation of cells, indicating that if we checked the cells in our mouse myox subpopulation, that we would be able to identify those in this secondary screen. And when we did a random PCR of about 10 colonies, we saw that in this case, all 10 of them were mouse myox. So that was probably luck of the draw, but I was really close to finishing my PhD. So we didn't do any more PCRs, but Regardless of the fact that we do see some cheaters here that were the rat myox that got through our sorting gate, we still see a significant enrichment of the population that we started with only 1% of our mouse myox. But interestingly, we do see this sort of linear trend within our output of our secondary screen, which indicated to us that this was sort of a fringe level of the population, which led to a highly variant phenotypic output, even amongst all mouse myox, because we did sequence some of the cells within these subpopulations and saw that they all had the same genetic sequence, but the way that they were expressing fluorescence in response to glucuronic acid was actually different at these fringes. And so from there, that was kind of where we ended and where we saw the biosensor indicated promise. So we were moving towards directed evolution of myox with our biosensor, but we were not quite there yet. And so the idea that we tried was to look into this actually doing it with a library. So I did towards the end of my PhD and earlier in my PhD, they were just all not super successful aim to create a library. So this red peak is our fully wild type and the black peak is that catalytically inactive negative control. And this blue peak is our library. And what we found very fascinating about the behavior when we made a library of myox mutants is that it almost showed entirely bimodal output. So they were either working about the same as wild type or they just weren't working at all. We didn't really see any medium behavior of this enzyme. And we said, well, let's just try this anyways. And so we took a small bit of the population and we saw that um, we were able to sequence a lot of mutant variants, but not many of them actually had, when we would further test them, any higher production levels. So what we were doing is we would go through, we'd do our screen, we would find this apparently better mutant, we would go through testing it, and this was triplicates in tubes, and we would see 
before we took the sequence and put it into a fresh plasmid, that even here, extracted from the experiment, cultured and grown up again, that it was still showing higher production and higher fluorescence. And once we took away the biosensor, put it into a fresh plasmid with only our myox expression, we saw that there was no significant increase in production level. So we saw these issues in the library that cheaters would get through, cheaters would get really far through, but then further testing would realize that they weren't actually improved, which made us believe that we were continuing to have some sort of something, whether it was mutations in the cell itself that were causing these cheaters to get through. And once again, a significant number of mutant, verified mutant sequences that had the same production level as our enzyme itself. And so we saw that it is possible to use these heterologous reactions in E. coli to make glucaric acid, but they can often suffer from poor performance and we want to improve that performance. So we have tools such as biosensors to indirectly estimate our product titers. But when we use these biosensors, it is another genetic circuit that we're putting in a cell. It is a cell that has its own functions. And so we saw that there was diffusion that the cells naturally did, probably for a good reason, that could lead to false biosensor activation. And we also saw that there were just unintended consequences of expressing these two circuits simultaneously in the cell that were causing excessive burden and leading to a failure of our biosensor to do what we were hoping it would do, but that we could fix these a little bit. So we could stop the product importation by removing a gene, and we could also minimize the burden through rational engineering choices to improve how the output of the biosensor relates to the production level. So where we wanna move on is we want to screen for improved producers, but we haven't quite done that yet due to the false positives that were a high risk. And so we would really like to see if there's any sort of control that we can do to see how can we make sure that we aren't overburdening the cells and that these cellular resources are adequately split between pathway, genome, and biosensor. Also, issues that we saw that continued to indicate to us that some sort of burden was happening, that as we continued to enrich, um, that we would like to continue to do enrichments and try to hone in on a wider amount of the cells at first to remove some of those outliers that we saw. And finally, what we would really like to do is use this one biosensor for glucuronic acid and simultaneously screen myox and MIPS and see if by evolving both at once, we can actually find a good synergistic combination of the two instead of evolving one enzyme and then evolving the other enzyme because we believe that there are gains to be had by finding the optimal pairing of solutions and not pairing together the optimal enzymes. And so with that, I would just like to thank the Prather Lab, um, the thesis committee I had that was awesome the whole time. Whenever I would show up and say, hey, something weird happened again, they would be really supportive and give really great ideas. And it was just a wonderful lab to work in. And I always enjoyed getting to go to work and hanging out with my coworkers. So, um, and thanks to the Flow Cytometry Corps at MIT who both helped me troubleshoot sorting and was just a great place to get some of the work that I had to do done. So with that, I am happy to take any questions and my email is on the slides as well if you'd like to email me. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, this is absolutely brilliant though. I believe Ron should leave very uh, yep. soon. Yeah, I, I have to sign up, a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, really brought out, you know, the, the realities of programming the cells and uh, it's, it's, it's always a journey. Uh, just real quick, so, you mentioned towards the end that um, thinking about controllers. I'm I'm curious whether you you know you thought about the feedback and feed forward controllers that would be able to maintain the biosensor levels uh, that would be independent uh, of other disturbances in the cells. And you think that they could be somehow normalized to always give you the you know kind of the exact uh, levels of your of your metabolic. Yes, that was really ideally what I was hoping to do, but it was kind of when it when I realized that that was what I should do, I think I had about six months of my PhD left and realized that that was jumping into an entire field that I would have needed to relearn a lot of yeah. math. Yeah. 
to do. And so it's really where I recommended, I gave a lot of papers and recommendations. I believe theoretically a postdoc at some point will join the lab and pick back up on this project. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that I can encourage a postdoc or another graduate student who takes the project to really look into that for um, success in this. Yeah. Great, fantastic talk. Thank so you, thank everyone. You. Okay, bye, everyone. Yep. So, uh, actually, the I have the question, uh, but I ask the audience question first. So Maya asked, could could the first positive be from plasmic copy number? Have you tried? integrating? So uh, I brought up integration of both biosensor and pathway to my advisor and my advisor who has much more experience and knowledge than me actually saw that when this pathway is expressed in the genome, it's actually the just the single copy number of the genome is not sufficient for us to get any sort of quantifiable output of glucuronic or glucaric acid. So while the biosensor may have been sensitive enough to detect the fluorescence, our equipment certainly was not to quantify the product. So while that would have been really helpful, it wasn't something we were able to do. And I did actually run into something I didn't mention in my talk, which was we were having dimers and tetramers of our plasmids. And so what I actually did is I made some steps to make sure I was doing end day reca knockouts and did uh, full plasmid sequencing with plasmid sorus to at least verify that we were not seeing a difference in dimers and tetramers. But that was also a source of false positives. Really good question. Thank you. So Jennifer, you know, I, I know your project very well because I studied that project. I'm also sorry for all the trouble you, you trouble you had because I also suffer from my project. So let me, I, I'm not because I know the project very well and also follow up and follow, I mean, your, your work or the Chris Sarah work, I mean, in terms of glucaric acid, I'm not going to ask the technical question, uh, but I want to ask one question. So you now done everything and then you are lecturer uh, for the future PhD student, let's say doing, uh, they do similar project, but not glucaric acid. What would you do differently if you start your PhD, but not glucaric acid project, but similar project, you know, working on? And what you would do differently? Just one thing or yeah, thank multiple you. things. Yeah, thank you for that question. So what I think I would really do if I were to want to be in this sort of biosensor genetic circuit area is I really would have loved to get more like thinking afterwards if I had started seeing the work that other people had already done on how gene circuits interact with each other and the unintended consequences of those and making sure I had an understanding of that. I think also understanding microbial physiology a lot better would have helped with some of the weird things we had. So digging into a lot of the background of the systems that we were using before attempting to apply the systems, which I guess isn't a very engineering thing of me to say, but it uh, feels like it would have really helped a lot of the head scratching that I did in, you know, my third and fourth year of my PhD. Yeah, that is a learning process. And then you now realize that or you are, you, you, I believe the crystal made the right decision that you graduate. So wonderful. So that's all the <laughs> learning process. That's wonderful. Okay, so now I see the 11.06 of the central time. So let's uh, close and then we chat afterward. So thank you all for joining and staying today. We will meet again next week on August 24, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Mark Brenner at University of Delaware and Professor Dave Carlick at Cranston University, as I mentioned earlier, an alum of Ron Weiss when he was at Princeton University. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here. If you are interested in chatting with us, I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty faces if you wish. Thanks, I stopped recording. Give me one second.
Just one second. Stop. 